In this video, I am not going to lie to you. I swear, cross my heart and hope to die. Do you really want to take a polygraph? Would you take a polygraph? Do you want to take a polygraph? Uh, you ended up in one of my strange corners. Buckle up, buckaroos. In today's strange video, we're going to look at the lies of the science of polygraphy, aka lie detector testing, and how from a scientific standpoint, it's absolute bullshit, and yet in practice, strangely still works in some situations. Yeah. First off, what exactly is a polygraph test and how does it work? The polygraph test was invented in 1920 by John Larson, who graduated Berkeley University with a PhD in physiology. A polygraph focuses on three physiological indicators, heart rate and blood pressure, respiration, and skin conductivity. When most people lie or do something wrong, they usually feel some type of physiological response. Your heart might feel like it's sinking. You feel a knot in your stomach. You may feel a type of revulsion or even hyperventilate. Furthermore, all people have unique, unconscious, physiological expressions that occur when a person is stimulated. With regards to deception, we'd say a person has a tick or a tell that shows they're being deceptive. It's these types of assumptions that might serve as evidence that some type of physiological test could accurately determine when a person is lying. But here's the problem. There's no real evidence that any pattern of physiological responses are unique to lying. Ticks are typically unique to every person. Someone who is extremely nervous may test negative when being truthful, and a dishonest person may have no anxiety whatsoever. And then there's people like me who are just anxious all the time. Beyond the theoretical problem that we aren't able to determine a valid pattern of physiological responses, psychologists and scientists agree there is little, if any, validity in the results of lie detector tests. The United States Supreme Court has repeatedly rejected the use of polygraph data in courtrooms citing unreliability. In 1988, the U.S. Congress passed the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, prohibiting private employers from using the machine to screen employees, though public employers can and still do use polygraph testing in their hiring practices, especially when it comes to law enforcement. In 2003, the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council concluded in a report that, quote, the scientific evidence supporting the accuracy of the polygraph to detect deception is intrinsically susceptible to producing erroneous results. Remember that guy John Larson who invented the machine? Even he came to reject the test, and inventing it was one of his biggest regrets. Larson found through his own research that results were inconclusive nearly 40% of the time. Larson remained a scientist, adopted the critical attitude, and falsified his own invention rightly when the evidence falsifying the tests appeared. Larson wrote in 1965, shortly before his death, quote, Beyond my expectation, through uncontrollable factors, this scientific investigation became for practical purposes a Frankenstein's monster, which I have spent over 40 years in combating. Despite all this, polygraphs are still used in a number of different circumstances. But why? Despite living in a regime of truth constructed on science, how are pseudoscientific forms of knowledge still able to function, still able to have scientific authority, and still able to circulate in society? Polygraphy was invented as a police investigatory practice. John Larson was also a police officer for the Berkeley Police Department way back in 1920. Both a police officer and a doctor. Hmm. Is he officer doctor or doctor officer? I like Dr. Officer better. So Dr. Officer Larson had a protege named Leonard Keeler, who was deeply fascinated with Dr. Officer's invention. However, unlike Larson, Keeler was not a scientist. He marketed the polygraph test. Now, Keeler couldn't patent the polygraph test because he didn't invent it, but he did invent the dominant way of interpreting the data provided by the machine. Keeler became a consultant selling his services and training people in the appropriate methods to use the machine. By God! According to this squiggly line here, you're a lying sack of shit. Oh, you would have thought. Mm. And in many, many cases, criminals do confess to crimes during or after a polygraph test that they actually committed. 
But is the reason this occurs because the lie detector test actually detected deceit? Or is it merely a placebo effect caused by the entire process of engaging in polygraph testing? Most people know very little about physiology or the pseudoscience of how the machine works or the myriad problems we've gone over so far. Many of us grew up watching shows like Maury Povich, Dr. Phil, and the Jerry Springer show if your parents weren't there. These shows frequently polygraphed alleged cheaters, spurned lovers, miscreant juveniles, and all other manner of people in crisis who could be commodified. And the lie detector test determined? That was a lie. Sadly, have you slept with another woman? You said no. The lie detector test determined? You're telling the truth. What? You said no. The lie detector test determined that was a lie. Did you touch your step-grandson's genitals for sexual gratification? that you were being deceptive. This gave many of us the belief that the lie detector test could detect lies. A person hears lie detector, remembers that hilarious moment on TV. That was a lie. <laughs> and accepts the scientific authority of the polygraph test. Let's look at a test case to look at the heuristic errors, bias, and placebo effect of so-called lie detector tests. Heuristics is a study of different methods and models of scientific inquiry. This is Christopher Lee Watts. Watts is a family annihilator who in 2018 strangled his pregnant wife before smothering his two daughters. When his family initially went missing, Watts claimed he had no idea where his family was, insinuating that his wife Shanann had run off or they had been kidnapped. Watts went so far as to do an interview with the local media begging for his family's swift return. Like when I got home yesterday, it was like a ghost town. Like she wasn't here, kids weren't here. I have no idea like where they went. Right now it's got K9 units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like they're they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent. If she wasn't here, like where did she go? Like once I got here, it was like, all right, who can I call? I called her three times, texted her about three times just to say, you know, what's going on? Like if she's vanished, like I want her back so bad. I want those kids back so bad. Right now I don't even want to just like throw anything out there like I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. Last night, I wanted, I, I wanted that knock on the door. I wanted to see the, I wanted to see those kids just run in, run in, just, just barrel rush me and just give me a hug and knock me on the ground. That's why last night was just horrible. I couldn't do it. it I just, I'm hoping that somebody sees something or somebody knows something and comes forward. Shanann, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. Like, if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with, without anybody here. Please bring her back. Literally almost everyone believed Watts had something to do with his family's disappearance from the very beginning. I just want to go talk to him. I'm going to get his info real quick. No. However, all the evidence pointing towards him was circumstantial at best, and was insufficient for a judge to issue an arrest warrant. Law enforcement either needed to find Shanann and their daughters, or they needed to get Watts to confess. After several hours of interrogation where police were clearly insinuating that Watts was guilty while Watts denied any involvement, a detective asked Watts if he will take a polygraph test. Would you take a polygraph? Sure. 
Okay. Watts accepts. So can we say that tomorrow at 11 o'clock? Sure. We can do a polygraph? Sure. Here. Um, I appreciate you coming in tonight. Mm -hmm. All right, give me a few minutes. The next day, Watts returns to the same interrogation room as before, but now with a polygraph testing unit present. Watts is introduced to a woman named Tammy who is the polygrapher. Um, this is Tammy. Did you meet Tammy yesterday? No, I'm good. I'm always Tammy. Hi, Chris. How are you? Of course, Watts doesn't know she's also a detective who has a vested interest in Watts confessing. If this were a legitimate scientific test, the polygrapher would be someone completely neutral. It should also be noted that the police are legally allowed to lie to you. Specifically, the United States Supreme Court ruled in the 1969 case Frazier v. Cup that police are allowed to use deception as an investigative tool. Officers will often lie to suspects, hoping to throw a suspect off. They may say that a suspect's friend has already confessed and blamed everything on the suspect, or that the DNA test came back positive. Even if these things are not true, it may trick the suspect into confessing. In the American crime drama television series The Wire, there's a scene where a young naive suspect agrees to a polygraph test. So can feel my heartbeat? The pulse, yeah. If Marno say I had the gun, he lying. The machine tells the tale, son. We ready, Professor? Yeah. We'll start with an easy one. Is your name, in fact, Deshaun Fredericks? Yeah. True. And did you and Monel shoot your boy Pookie down on Carey Street just like Monel said you did? No, nah, no. Lie. You lying, mother mm. Mm -hmm. The machine is never wrong, son. Man, he can't never keep his damn mouth shut. I should have busted a cap and pooped ass my own self. Left Marnell home and shit. He just a bitch, is all. In case you didn't notice, that is not a polygraph test. His hand is just duct taped to a copy machine. Back to the Watts case. Tammy the polygrapher quickly begins listing a number of alleged accomplishments that show her prowess and authority in discerning truth from deception. Obviously you're probably nervous about taking today's test. Honestly, I would think something is wrong with you if you weren't nervous about coming no. in here to take a polygraph. No. Even if people are like, I don't have anything to hide, it is nerve wracking. Oh, and yeah. I have taken tons of polygraphs, obviously in my training, um, I went to 10 weeks for training. I've been a polygrapher about, for about five years. Um, I went to the best school in the country. So I want you to have confidence in the fact that if you had nothing to do with this disappearance, like we're going to find that out today. Okay, I have the best training that they offer in the United States. Um, I, we use the most validated testing. Um, that was the way I'm going to ask you the question. So believe me, if you had nothing to do with this, I will be able to show them that today. Even if these accomplishments are true, with the pseudoscientific nature of polygraph testing, it's about as useful as being certified in phrenology or eugenics or psychoanalysis. Tammy then performs a pretest where Watts is asked basic questions and is told to answer falsely to some of them. So I'm going to say before 2018, did you ever lose your temper with someone you cared about? And you're going to say no, because you're telling a lie. Awesome. This is allegedly to get a baseline reading for Watts when he's telling the truth or not. At the end of this, Tammy tells Watts that he is a really bad liar and describes his baseline false statement as extreme. You did great. Uh, was... You remembered to lie and everything. That was awesome. That was... <laughs> so yeah. you obviously are a really bad liar. Have, have people told you that before? Like the second you tell a lie, like they can tell like on your face that... Because the second you lied to the number three, like, I don't know if you heard me clicking, but I like, turned down the sensitivity because you're starting to go off the page. So that is what I need to see as a polygrapher because that tells me that you know it's wrong to tell a lie. Um, and you're actually having a significant reaction when you lie. So that is awesome. So thank you for being a wrong okay, liar. I, I, no, that's a good go. thing. That's a good thing. We don't want to be good liars. So. Thank you for being a horrible liar. Um, and that just shows me that, you know, obviously on the test when they're asking, you know, significant stuff about your wife, um, if you're lying to that, it's going to be even 10 times more amplified. So 
I well, appreciate that. I appreciate that very much, more than you know. So. This technique is known as the stimulation test and can be found in a 1997 textbook given to Department of Defense Polygraph Institute examiners. Quote, do not show the test to the examinee, the book instructs, but convince the examinee that deception was indicated. After administering the test, the examiner is to describe the results to the subject. Of course, Tammy never actually shows Watts the raw data showing this, but even if she did, Watts would have no real way of deciphering the data. This is a philosophical problem that comes from observation. Both Tammy and Watts could look at the same reading that is basically just a squiggly line and see completely different things. A big part of scientific observation involves the eye being properly trained to know what to look for. Even though polygraphy is pseudoscience, in order for its truths to function and circulate requires a specific type of training for the polygrapher on the proper interpretation of said squiggly line. Watts takes the polygraph test, and after what I'm sure was a careful and thorough reading of the squiggly line, and presumably some tea leaves, surprise, surprise, the police determine that the person they believe is guilty, quote unquote, failed the polygraph test. So I brought Graham in here because we want to talk to you about the results, okay? So, um, it is completely clear that you were not honest during the testing, and I think you already know that. Um, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. Right? Again, they don't show Watts any of the data confirming this, but they use strong declarative statements of the futility of arguing with science. Everything that I've just, I have told you, I did not lie on this polygraph. I am, I don't know how much I could, I could just tell you right now, like, I did not. It's, 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 not even, it's not even an option right now because uh, you did not pass the polygraph, uh, so I know you were being deceptive. You did not pass the polygraph, so I know you were being deceptive. So, that's not even an issue, an issue right now. The issue right now is what happened to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. Of course, Watts actually was being deceptive when he said, Regarding Shanann's disappearance, do you intend to answer all of the questions truthfully? Yes. Did you physically cause Shanann's disappearance? No. Are you lying about the last time you saw Shanann? No. Do you know where Shanann is now? No. Watts did in fact murder his entire family, and he is a lying sack of shit. Watts did eventually confess to everything, and he will spend the rest of his life in prison. However, it's highly unlikely that even if the test reported those statements as false, that this is not mere coincidence. Furthermore, there seems to be no way to tell whether it is the polygraph result itself that leads to confession or merely a placebo effect caused by the quote-unquote authority the polygrapher is believed to have. The final question we need to answer is whether you should ever agree to a polygraph with law enforcement. And the answer is no! No, if it wasn't obvious by now. Even if you quote-unquote pass the test, it's not as if you could use it to your advantage at court because again, it's inadmissible because it's bullshit. Let's go back to Chris Watts. Right here. When he's told he failed the test, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. He was still legally allowed to leave. Despite all the circumstantial evidence, police still did not have enough probable cause to get an arrest warrant because, again, the polygraph test is not legit in court. Watts made three mistakes. Mistake one, he murdered his entire family. Seriously, dick move, dude. Mistake two, he didn't have a lawyer present during his interrogation. And mistake three, he agreed to a polygraph test. Don't be like Watts. This is part of a series of Philosophy of Science videos where we use Karl Popper's methodology of scientific inquiry, called falsification, to test different theories and hypotheses, and determine whether they are science or pseudoscience. We did a whole video on falsification that you should check out. Please like, subscribe, comment, or however else your precious attention self identifies. Thank you to my patrons, especially you, Srepit, for their support. Bye.